Okay, everyone, welcome to our next webinar. Before we begin, I want to point out the Q&A feature in Zoom or in Central. There should be a button on the top left or towards the bottom middle, depending on your screen, that says Q&A. You can click on that to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation. We'll answer them at the end of the webinar. Today, we'll cover one of our newer RFIs on formulating stable natural colors for beverages. To present on this topic, we have Nick Milanovich, who is Zenova's Director of Innovation Services, manager of this RFI, and most appropriately, a chemist with experience in formulations. Uh, so Nick, I'll let you take it from Thanks, Giovanni. When you go into the store and you look at beverages, many of them are colored, and oftentimes these are synthetic colors. While synthetic, synthetic colors are pure, they're stable, they're easy to work with, they are in fact synthetic, and uh, nowadays can be a turn off to a turn off to consumers. And so uh, the solution to that is to include natural colors in place of the synthetics. And, but there are challenges with uh, using natural colors. They are certainly from a natural source, but they often we extract some uh, a color from a, a natural source. You may have uh, impart certain tastes and smells and uh, other aesthetics to the other to the beverage. Also, as with any colorant, it can be sensitive to the light temperature and even uh, pH. And this RFI uh, features two things that I want to focus you on is that is stabilization and formulation. How to stabilize natural colors that are already commercially available. And the solutions that you're looking at to stabilize will result in a formulation of, for that beverage. So it's the natural color plus all the other ingredients that make up the beverage and keep the natural color stable in that environment. Now, there's a whole host of natural colors. But we're going to, so we need to narrow this down a little bit. We're going to focus in on two types of natural colors, the anthocyanins and the carotenoids. Anthocyanins uh, usually will, at low pHs, will give you colors like purple, red, and blues. At higher pHs, they could change colors to something more in the orange. Uh, and then the carotenoids are probably most familiar with, with carrots, but here's like a gag fruit that shows you the oranges and the yellows you would get from these. Now for the chemists in the audience, now what does this mean? This look, all those anthocyanins and carotenoids look like this. Here's a general structure, plus you know there's some little variability depending on the exact uh, anthocyanin and carotenoid you, you're uh, referring to. So you'll see on the left-hand side that the anthocyanins are water-soluble uh, molecules and the carotenoids are not. Now we're going to take these types of natural colors and we're going to create a beverage. Now the conditions under which these two types of um, colorants need to be stable are as follows. Number one, they need to be stable under a very specific pH range of around two and a half to three and a half. So it's a pretty acidic environment. And then also you, the, uh, the shelf stability should be six months at ambient temperature, say roughly 70 degrees Fahrenheit. These, uh, there is also a question that um, folks have brought up already in pre-submission feedback related to, you know, what is the temperature at which these beverages are processed? Well, in some cases, those can be very high temperatures. Uh, the folk, they're only exposed to these high temperatures for a very short period of time. So the more important thing is these ambient temperatures, these temperatures at which the beverage sits while in a warehouse, while on a truck, while in the store, while being transported to very warm climate countries. And in addition to this pH requirement, you're going to add in a flavor, or sorry, a stabilizer, and then you want to maintain the aesthetics. You don't want the color to change. Sometimes pH changes the color that you expect. Uh, it can change the flavor, it can change the, the appearance, the, the opacity of the beverage. For instance, um, one publication showed that green tea extract could uh, stabilize anthocyanins. However, you if you have a fruity beverage and all of a sudden you taste green tea, that will not work. That's imparting a different flavor to the product. In addition to that, 
we're looking at ingredients that are considered grass, meaning generally regarded as safe. The reason for this is, if you think about it, PepsiCo is a company that puts out products on a market, and then how do they make the beverage? Well, they will buy the ingredients, prepare it, mix it up, and bottle it, and then ship it out to the stores. They're not making ingredients from scratch. Moreover, if the ingredient is not grass, then it's a very, very lengthy process in order to be qualify that those ingredients to be used in um, foods and beverages. So you can't in, you can't take something say for the electronics industry that has no no safety profile and put it into um, a beverage because you know the polymer might work for uh, stabilization, but there's no safety profile, that's not gonna fly. That's years and years of work in order to get that. And in addition to that, it's an ingredient suitable for beverages. There may be some stabilizers for natural colors that work in different kinds of products that are more or solid and powder, but does it work, do these ingredients, these stabilizers work in beverages? And finally, ideally, the solution can work for anthocyanins and carotenoids, both. I know this is a challenge. If you think of something that stabilizes anthocyanins only or carotenoids only, we still want to hear about those as well. And you may be wondering, you know, are there solutions already out there for natural colors? And quite honestly, there are. However, for various reasons that I've outlined here, I won't go through all of them, uh, these points here, but solutions are available, but they don't fit the criteria I just described earlier. pHs are different, um, the microencapsulation doesn't work, other aesthetics are involved, um, and uh, so on. So solutions are available, but not necessarily appropriate for the conditions that we want to formulate these uh, natural colors under. And then also to kind of narrow the focus down, so what colors are we targeting in this case? We're talking about anthocyanins, we're talking about carotenoids, and we're looking at five different color groups right now. And there they are, very simply. Red, orange, yellow, pink, and purple. Now I will note here that the colors of the red, orange, yellow, pink, and purple are just what our PowerPoint is able to reproduce. They're not the specific pinks and purples, et cetera that we're targeting. But this is just for illustration purposes. Now please avoid also caramel and um, carmine uh, colors. The caramel produces the brown colors, carmine produces various types of red, reds. We're gonna limit it to anthocyanins and carotenoids and not these. These have different chemistries that um, you know, all together. Another thing to keep in mind, you know, how does the solution impact the product? First of all, of course, always consider cost. And we're looking to target uh, some type of cost that is uh, less than or equal to the cost of uh, existing natural colors. I'm giving you a ballpark of around $40 per pound uh, for the solution. And then the other part is, you know, don't impact the aesthetics whether it's the color, whether it's the uh, taste and pH, et cetera. The other factor I'm gonna reiterate is consider the safety and regulatory implications. Is this ingredient grass? Is it, you know, is it uh, accepted by the FDA or European, European Union regulatory body? Now, hopefully it is. Do the best, and any solution you provide, do the best you can in answering this question. I know it's not the easiest question to answer, but do your best to guide us. Also, uh, I am putting in there uh, any non-novel, uh, Pepsi had asked us to uh, include any non-grass ingredients with the, with the proviso that uh, this ingredient is commercializable and effective, but if you choose to submit a solution um, based on that criteria, it better knock our socks off because that will be a harder one to um, 
to want to pursue. It'll be, it'll be much more reluctant to pursue something that's not grass unless uh, it's thought through. If you have any questions on that, definitely reach me over in intercom. I do respond to, um, I have responded to pre-submission questions. So please reach out before going through all the trouble of a, of a submission, of a full submission, a solution report. All right, I'm gonna reemphasize this for a reason. You know, the goal of this RFI is to stabilize natural color. It's stabilization and formulation. And the reason I bring this up and reemphasize this is, um, fortunately, and I'm glad to hear this, is that uh, our inventors are asking, you know, are submitting pre-submission feedback. And I'm emphasizing this because some of the things kind of are out of the scope of this particular RFI. So two things that I know for sure that are out of scope is solutions that uh, are extraction methods. Pepsi is not a company to create the natural dye. They are, they buy it from a vendor who does this. So they are not in the business of extracting dyes from natural sources. So solutions that are extraction methods are out of scope and making new colors are out of scope. We want already commercially available natural colors and ways to stabilize them. The other uh, ideas that are out of scope is to modifying bottles. These are really actually clever ideas. These solutions exist and are very, very costly. So modifying the bottle has different implications as well. Pepsi doesn't make the bottles, they buy them. The bottles have to be recyclable. Well, if you add in an ingredient to the material of the bottle, it's no longer recyclable. So there's that problem. So we're gonna avoid anything that modifies the bottle and any kind of extraction methods. And that is the gist and summary of the, of the RFI. We definitely, definitely look forward to hearing your ideas and uh, I'll open it up to questions now, Shivani. Okay, we have a question from Brian. Can you clarify the cost constraint? For example, adding something to natural colors would inherently increase the cost. So is $40, per, $40 per pound estimate for the stabilizer alone or for the color and the stabilizer? So it would be the cost of the solution. Um, so the color, I would say color and stabilizer. Uh, what could happen also is, uh, when making these formulas, sometimes you account for the loss in color by adding extra color and then it, that you lose it. However, if you can stabilize it, you may lose, uh, you may use, might use less color than you normally would have. So you could save the cost there. And $40 is a rough estimate. So if you're giving me something that's $100 a pound cost, then that's kind of way out of line. But um, I'm thinking ballpark. 40 bucks, it could be a little bit more than that, but in that general area. All right, next question was uh, how to measure uh, color. And that one is, well, you do it in a couple different ways. You can do it using UV Viz, and you can see how the absorption changes over time. And then there's other ways to do it using a, uh, what do you call it, LA and B value. I forget what the exact uh, name of that method is, but. L looks at light and dark, and uh, actually you have an E value, it's uh, the chromatic scale, I think. So there's a couple ways of doing that. Um, maybe this is available on what has been tried already. Um, there are a bunch of things that have been tried. <laughs> so um, microencapsulation I know has been tried, and I don't know if you mean uh, uh, tried by Pepsi or tried in general. Um, but I'll give you examples of what I've seen that has been looked at. I know there's been uh, microencapsulation looked at. I know there has been uh, looked at um, phenolic compounds as stabilizers. And there has been uh, amino acids looked at as stabilizers. I think vitamin C has been used as a stabilizer. Sometimes it actually backfires, what vitamin C does. And, um, I know, um, let me see what else has been done. Whey proteins have been tried, and I'm talking about this in very general terms. Uh, there are some publications out there 
um, because people are actively working on stabilizers for these natural products. Okay, um, then Brian, a question from you. Do you have recommendations on how we can demonstrate six months stability since RFI closes in two months? Um, I don't off the top of my head. I know that um, based on some papers I've seen, um, people have done like seven days at like 40 degrees C. So it's an accelerated type of uh, stability testing. And you compare something with and without stabilizers to see if there's any increase in um, uh, color loss. So um, look at some, there are some papers in food, uh, journal Food Chemistry, and I think it may even be uh, cited in the RFI. So those are very helpful actually. Okay, how much loss in color is allowed? I don't have a, a, a way to quantify that answer in terms of like say a scientific measurement. What I would say is if you're gonna try actually do that measurement, uh, if you see a visible loss, then the, that's of course bad news. And then especially even under these accelerated conditions. So, um, but that's the best answer I could really give you without give you a without quantifying for you. Um, uh, Larry, uh, what causes the lack of stability? Is it generally oxidation? Does the color need to be stable at the, after the bottle is open and reclosed? Um, the lack of stability can happen in a few cases. It's photodegradation, it's oxidation. Uh, it could be pH. So a change in pH will change uh, color. Uh, especially for the anthocyanins, that's definitely true. Uh, for instance, anthocyanins at very acidic pHs, like say around three-ish, uh, will be in the you know red and purple, uh, will look red and purple, but in pHs that are more neutral, they, that same anthocyanin could be more like an orange. So it could be, it could go through quite dramatic color changes. Um, does it need to be stable? And the second part of your question, does the color need to be stable after the bottle is open? I would think it, that color doesn't linger around too much, uh, that beverage doesn't linger around in the bottle without being, if it degrades after the bottle opens, that's a very unstable formula. Um, so I would think it would, it would have gone through more degradation between the time it's made and in the store and bought um, than it would after it's open and reclosed. All right, again, thank you for attending. And if you have any other questions as you kind of digest this information, everything I have spoken about is contained in the RFI. I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions you have from that.